God the most beneficent, the most merciful. And remember the favor of Allah, God, upon you and his covenant with which he bound you when he said, we hear, when you said, we hear and we obey. And fear Allah, indeed Allah is knowing of that within the breast. Be persistently standing firm for Allah. Witness injustice and do not let the hatred of the people prevent you from being just. Be just that is nearer to righteousness. And fear Allah, indeed Allah is acquainted with that which you do. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Alright, Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much, Brother Abdul Qadir, for that beautiful recitation. So once again, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Abdullah Ansari, and I will be the host for the evening. So the Muslim Student Association, for those of you that aren't that, aren't that familiar with it, is, a, is an organization um, that is, is a religious-based organization, and we hold events all year long, everything from the weekly samosa sales, to the Jum'ah prayer, to the lectures, to the brothers' hangouts and the sisters' hangouts. And tonight is one of the most special nights for the MSA, alhamdulillah. The culminating dinner is one of our biggest events, alhamdulillah. And it is the culminating event for the, the most anticipated week of the year, which is Islam Appreciation Week. So... It has been, we can confidently say, alhamdulillah, that this week has been extremely beneficial for each and every single one of us. It has been a week that we've been able to reach out to the, to the different people, the different communities here on campus, and engage in dialogue and conversation. This year's IAW theme is social justice. Throughout the week, we have hosted social, educational, religious, and service activities on campus in an effort to build relationships with those around us and to stand up together in solidarity against injustice. So injustices against within ourselves, within our communities, and within society. Tonight we'll be exploring one of the most relevant injustices of our time, Islamophobia. We will be discussing the effects of Islamophobia on justice in our communities and what we can do as students to be true revivers of justice. Joining us tonight is one of the most distinguished and accomplished political activists of our time, Dalia Mugahid. Dalia Mugahid is the Director of Research for the Institute, at the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, where she leads the organization's pioneering research and thought leadership programs on American Muslims. Mugahid is former Executive Director at the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies, where she led the analysis of surveys of Muslim communities worldwide. With John L. Esposito, Dalia Mugahid co-authored the book named Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. President Barack Obama appointed Dalia Mugahid on the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships in 2009. She was invited to testify before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations about U.S. engagement with Muslim communities, and she provided significant co contributions to the Homeland Security Council's Countering Violent Extremism Working Group recommendations. 
She is a frequent expert commentator in global media outlets and international forums, and she is also the CEO of Mugahed Consulting. So without further ado, help me in giving a warm welcome to Dalia Mugahed. Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon you. It is such an honor to be here this evening. Uh, I can't tell you how flattered I am that you invited me to be the speaker at the culmination dinner. It's such an important week. Um, I grew up just a few hours away from here in Madison, Wisconsin, and I used to go to summer camp with people from Chicago, and a lot of them went on to go to Loyola. I feel like Loyola is kind of my, my second home school. I actually attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And having grown up so close to here, having grown up in a, in a liberal college town, I was passionate about social justice. It was this passion for social justice that first led me on a path to study my faith. I didn't consider my religion something that I was simply inheriting. It was something that I believed I needed to own and embrace deliberately, consciously, in an informed way. And I came from this tradition, this progressive tradition of social justice. And as I read the Quran, as I truly opened the possibility of not simply inheriting, but choosing to be a Muslim, it was through this lens of social justice that I was really evaluating this book. And it was because of this idea of social justice that I embraced and really fell in love with the Quran. That was the beginning. It was the idea of justice, the theme of justice, being just even if it's against yourself. And it's really this passion for justice that has led me to the kind of work I do today. I research the American Muslim community, and I talk about the American Muslim community and about Islam all over the country and really all over the world. And more and more, there's this dark shadow that seems to emerge every time this topic of Muslims comes to the fore. It comes in different um, formats. It, it, it's called different things. At the end of the day, it is simply a form of bigotry called Islamophobia. I'm going to just define Islamophobia as a bigotry against Islam or Muslims, a discrimination or a bigotry against Islam and Muslims. And what I would like to talk to you about this evening is why I believe that Islamophobia is a threat to every American, not just Muslims, not just people who look like Muslims, but to every single American who cares about social justice. And then I'll go on to give you some suggestions of what I think we should do about it as people of conscience, as people who care about justice. There's a few things that I, I think is important to understand about Islamophobia. Why do I say that it is actually a threat to every single American? First, because Islamophobia opens the door to other kinds of bigotry. 
And this is not just a theoretical or intuitive conclusion that I'm talking about. This is an empirical fact. One study that my organization came out with about a year ago called Manufacturing Bigotry, it studied anti-Sharia legislation. Are you guys familiar with it? Do you know what anti-Sharia legislation is? No. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It, it is a state-level law. It's not a federal law. It's a state-level law in, in many states. It's been proposed in almost every state at some level, and it's been passed in, in about half a dozen states where any document that is seen or, or presumed to be, uh, to be based on, quote, sharia is no longer uh, admissible in court. I actually thought that anti-Sharia legislation was a solution without a problem. There isn't really a movement of people trying to implement Sharia. What I found out, though, is that it affects real people in real ways, because if you have a will that is based on your Islamic religious principles, it is no longer acceptable in court if these laws are passed. If you have a uh, divorce or, or marriage um, document based on the principles of your faith as a Muslim, it is no longer permissible in court. Whereas any other document based on the religious principles of any other American, an American Jew, an American Christian, that is okay and that is admissible in court. It is only a discriminatory act against Muslims. So it is a clear and present danger to the religious freedom of Muslims. Now here's the interesting thing about anti-Sharia legislation. The lawmakers who propose anti-Sharia legislation, are they just targeting Muslims? Is this an isolated anti-Muslim phenomenon? The answer is no. There is an 80% overlap, this is what the study found, between lawmakers, the same lawmakers that go after Muslims are going after the voting rights of African Americans and Latinos. They're going after labor rights. They're going after women's rights. They're going after immigrants. And the list goes on. So Islamophobia and Islamophobic legislation opens the door and emboldens and empowers the bigotry against so many other groups. It is not an isolated phenomenon. It is a threat to people of color, to women, and to other historically marginalized communities. Another thing about Islamophobia, again empirically, this is not just you know simply an intuitive uh, um, guess, is that Islamophobia is empirically linked to anti-Semitism. And to be absolutely clear, an increase in Islamophobia is linked to an increase in, in anti-Semitism. Some people, unfortunately, are under the false assumption that somehow these two things move in opposite directions, that Islamophobia is actually good for Jews. That's absolutely, positively false. One study found, and this was a study that I personally worked on at Gallup, when we looked at anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States, we looked at all kinds of variables. What are the things that predicted Americans self-reporting that they had extreme prejudice against Muslims? Was it low education? Was it religious zealotry? Was it the fact that they uh, you know, didn't know a Muslim? No, none of these things, all of them actually were, were factors, but they weren't the strongest factor. None of those things were the strongest factor that predicted anti-Muslim prejudice. The strongest, the single strongest factor that predicted anti-Muslim prejudice was anti-Jewish prejudice. When people admitted having harboring anti-Jewish prejudice, they were 30 times more likely to also report having anti-Muslim prejudice. So Islamophobia is a threat to Jews. 
because it is linked empirically with anti-Semitism. Now, what if you're not Jewish, you're not a person of color, you're not a member of a historically marginalized community? Are you okay? Is it not your problem? The answer is no. Islamophobia makes every single American less safe. First, it strengthens terrorist rhetoric. If you study, if you just look at what is the narrative of an extremist group like ISIS, it's very simple. It's that this, this monolithic body called the non-Muslim world is inherently against Islam and Muslims. That it is out to destroy Islam and Muslims. And they, they create this narrative to rally people to their cause. Islamophobia plays right into their hands. It strengthens their narrative. When we give a group like ISIS the legitimacy of calling them Islamic, we are empowering and emboldening and fueling their narrative. So it makes us unsafe for that first reason. The second is it actually opens the space for extremist ideology. By alienating young people from their own country, increasing alienation is actually the single strongest factor in the process of radicalization. It's not religiosity. It is alienation. So Islamophobia also works on the audience of these extremist groups by increasing the psychological space in which this kind of narrative could flourish. Third, Islamophobia makes us less safe because it distracts us from bigger threats. According to an important study that came out in June of last year by Duke University, the vast majority of terrorist acts in the United States are carried out by white supremacists or government separatists, not Muslims. It's not even close. When we focus entirely on a Muslim threat, we are distracted from where the actual terrorist threat in the United States comes from. And that's from white supremacists and government separatists, anti-government separatists. So it distracts us from a bigger threat when our thinking and our judgment is impaired by prejudice. And fourth, Islamophobia radicalizes white supremacists against Muslims. That's another way it makes us unsafe because it incites violence against Muslims and people who are deemed to look like Muslims. It incites violence against people of color. When this rhetoric is repeated every single day, people are given permission to express the hate that they may have not felt was, quote, politically correct until now. When, when things that are socially unacceptable are suddenly okay, it actually gives people permission to act on that prejudice. And that's why there has been a, uh, a spike in hate crimes against Muslims, according to the latest FBI report. Islamophobia also makes us less free. Thomas Jefferson famously said that the foundation of a democracy is a well-informed citizenry. Without a well-informed citizenry, without people, ordinary citizens that are thinking for themselves, we don't have a democracy. We simply have a group of a population that is swayed according to whoever can buy the most negative Q 
campaign ads. That's not a democracy. A democracy requires that people make rational, well-informed decisions. That is what the quality and the strength of our democracy depends on. Now, take this, or, or consider this. One study found that 80% of media coverage of Islam and Muslims is negative. Now that might not really sound like it makes, you know, that, that it's, it, might, it might not really make any sense. What is 80%? I mean, it kind of sounds high, but is it really high? Maybe all religions are portrayed negatively. The answer is no. Other faiths in the study were mostly portrayed in a neutral manner. The majority of the coverage was neutral, whereas the vast majority of the coverage of Islam and Muslims was negative. Whereas other faiths were, uh, were portrayed through their religious leaders, it was only Islam where the majority of protagonists representing the faith in media were armed militants. Now just for a point of reference, North Korea, which is a designated terrorist state, a state that's actually threatened the United States with attack, when this study looked at its portrayal, portrayal of North Korea, it was 72% negative. So you have a faith of 1.6 billion people more negatively portrayed in TV news media than North Korea, a designated terrorist state. Another study looked at the New York Times, right? The number one paper in America, a paper that is considered liberal, and found that Islam was more negatively portrayed in the New York Times than was cancer or cocaine. Now, take that, you know, kind of consider that, ruminate on that, and think about the impact of this kind of negative media. What does it do? Well, it instills fear. It is, it is information that makes people afraid. Now, how does fear impact human beings? Well, according to neuroscience, fear does at least three things to us from, from an actual neurological perspective. Fear makes us more accepting of authoritarianism, conformity, and prejudice. Three things that are the most corrosive possible elements to the foundation of our democracy. So Islamophobia makes us less free because fear kills freedom. Another study found that people, this is an actually a, a controlled study, where subjects were shown anti-Muslim stories, anti-Muslim uh, news stories, and then the control group was not shown these stories. And then both groups were asked about their level of acceptance of military intervention in Muslim countries and policies domestically that took away civil liberties. And guess what? The people who were exposed to the negative news stories were much more accepting of military intervention, acts that cost our taxpayers trillions of dollars, as well as, US, as, well as American lives, not to mention lives overseas, and the erosion of our civil liberties at home. Now this is not just academic. If you actually track anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States from 2001 to 2013, you'll notice something very interesting. A lot of times people will hear all of these statistics that I just mentioned and say, well, you know, sorry, but Muslims are always blowing things up, so what exactly is the news supposed to be saying? Of course it's going to be negative. Maybe you should stop doing negative things, and then the news will stop being negative about you. 
But here's my response to that. Okay, that's fine. I, I, I will humor that or, or entertain that notion for a minute. If that is true, if, if it's just about bad people doing bad things and that's why there's all this negative press, then we would expect anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States to follow or to spike around terrorist attacks. I mean, wouldn't that make sense? If it's just an organic, normal response to bad Muslims doing bad things, then we should see spikes in anti-Muslim sentiment right after terrorist attacks. When you actually track anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States, again, between 2001 and 2013, you see something very strange. Because anti-Muslim sentiment between these two years does not actually correspond with terrorist attacks. It didn't get worse after 9-11. It actually got slightly better in terms of anti-Muslim sentiment, believe it or not. And it didn't change at all after the Boston bombing. Now, when did it spike? In the run-up to the Iraq war, where there were no new attacks, and during the 2008 and 2012 election cycle among Republican primary voters. Again, no new attacks. So you have a spike in anti-Muslim sentiment among Republican voters in the 2008 and 2012 election cycle that went up by 14 points and no change after the Boston bombing. So no, anti-Muslim sentiment is not some organic natural phenomenon. It is manufactured. It is a tool of political manipulation. Now what should we do about it? it if, if it is indeed a threat to every single American, to anyone who cares about our safety as well as our freedom, what should we do? The first thing I think we need to do is recognizing bigotry and calling it out in the media and in politics. Now, sometimes it's very easy to see, it's very easy to recognize. It's right now people um, are, are pretty uh, bold in their anti-Muslim statements. But sometimes it's a little more subtle, okay? And so I'm gonna talk about the subtle versions, the subtle kind of uh, shades of Islamophobia. Now, one very common one is collective guilt. Collective guilt is a form of bigotry. And it is something that all minority groups face in some way or another, for the most part. Which is that when a member of their group does something bad, the entire group is held accountable. The entire group is asked to answer for it. The entire group is asked to explain it. Whereas when a member of the majority group does something bad, that person is simply a lone wolf individual and no one else needs to respond. No one else is asked or suspected of agreeing or condoning horrible acts committed by members of their group. And that double standard is something that I think we need to call out and at least be sensitive to, raise awareness of. Another way that there's sort of this subtle Islamophobia that needs to be called out and, and understood is, is sort of related, which is this idea of fundamental attribution error. What is fundamental attribution error? Basically, it's attributing evil acts to a person's inherent character. In the case of Muslims, to a person's faith. Rather to say, rather than, you know, mental illness or some kind of external circumstances. If you compare media coverage 
of different kinds of mass violence in the United States. You will notice you, it, it, is a, it is an amazing case study in, 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 in fundamental attribution error. When it's a member of the majority, that person's external conditions are studied. Their family life is discussed. Their mental illness is, is usually assumed to be um, you know, part, of, part of the problem, even if they've had no history of mental illness. They are automatically uh, uh, you know, judged to simply have been mentally ill. Because it, the, the group as a whole cannot possibly be blamed for the actions of that one criminal. And yet that kind of rigor and those kinds of questions are rarely employed when that evil act is committed by someone who calls themselves a Muslim. Now, I know the response to this is, well, other people just do horrible things like mass shootings. They're not doing it in the name of their faith. Well, first of all, two things I think that are important to keep in mind. There's, a lot of times there's virtually no evidence that a Muslim is committing an act of violence in the name of their faith. We, we actually don't have real hard evidence other than their name and their identity of what their motives were. But we automatically think it's because, it's because of Islam. And notice that. Ask the real hard question. What is the actual evidence that this person committed this act in the name of some kind of extremist religious ideology? And I challenge you, in many cases, there's virtually nothing. It's very hard to prove. Much harder, it's, it's actually much easier to call someone a religious zealot than it is to call a, a crime a hate crime. It's very interesting. It's, it's almost impossible to name um, a, a, like a crime against, say, a black church a hate crime. But, but a crime is called a terrorist crime uh, or a, you know, a, a, an act on, on, uh, committed by a Muslim is called terrorism with, with barely no evidence of actual ideological motives. But there, the other thing is that there is hardly any discussion, actually virtually no discussion of a Muslim's mental illness or a Muslim's mental state. It's as if Muslims are incapable of being mentally ill. It is, it is impossible. It is a cure to mental illness simply by being a Muslim. You can't have a terrible family life. You can't just go postal. It is, it is impossible. There cannot be external problems in your life to make you do something. It must be your faith. And I think this is a form of bigotry that is so subtle and yet so prevalent. And we have to be brave enough to call these things out. These double standards don't help anybody. And they, and they definitely don't make us safer. There's also inconsistent definitions of terrorism. And I'm going to read you an actual headline from the Washington Times. Now this was an article about that study I mentioned earlier, the Duke study that said that the majority of uh, domestic terrorist acts were carried out by white supremacists or anti-government uh, anti separatists. Here's the headline. I'm not kidding, this is the real headline. Majority of fatal attacks on US soil carried out by white supremacists, not terrorists. You can't be white and be a terrorist, according to the New York Times. I'm sorry, according to the Washington Times. I'm sorry if I said the New York Times. This is the Washington Times. So an inconsistent definition of terrorism. And we do need to recognize this as a form of Islamophobia. There's also a very interesting inconsistent coverage, not only an, in an inconsistent definition, but inconsistent level of coverage of terrorism. Has anyone in this room heard of a man named Glendon Scott Crawford? Okay. It never, uh, I, I never lose money on this one. I always say $100 if you know who this guy is and no one ever knows. I've never, lost a, I've never lost a dime, but here's who he is. And I'm quoting now from an article. 
Glendon Scott Crawford was a terrorist who attempted to acquire a weapon of mass destruction and to use it to kill innocent members of the Muslim community, said Richard Hartunian, U.S. United States Attorney for the Northern District of New York. This same gentleman was also planning on killing the president. He received 99 years of prison time, and this was in August 21st, 2015, and you have never heard of it. Just imagine, had this guy, had, had, had the, the, um, the identities of the would-have-been victims and the perpetrator simply been switched, and then ask if you would have heard of the perpetrator's name. So there is an inconsistent coverage of terrorism. So call it out, recognize it, become aware of it. That is the first step. The second is to build meaningful coalitions. This is not a problem that Muslims should be dealing with alone. There are essentially two objectives of racism of any kind. The first is to distract you so that you do nothing but just prove and, 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 and go around per, you know, convincing people you have a right to exist and that you're fully human. You don't have time to do anything else but simply defend your right to exist. That's objective number one is to distract you. But objective number two, and it's just as important, is the objective of racism or any kind of bigotry is to make you feel isolated, is to make you feel small, is to make you feel alone, is to make you feel like nobody cares about you and you're in this by yourself so you should just keep your head down and not make any problems. You should just give in. You should just surrender. Because everyone around you is more powerful and they all hate you. That is what bigotry wants you to believe. And it is completely wrong. There are so many stretched out hands right now to the Muslim community. And all that Muslims have to do, students and others, is to reach out to other people of conscience and build coalitions against, against Islamophobia and racism. Because it's not just a Muslim problem, it is a danger to every single American. Build coalitions around common goals. Build coalitions around common problems. Racism and Islamophobia are just two sides of the exact same thing. They're two symptoms of the same disease. And then finally, I encourage you to gain inspiration from success stories. Because they're, all, they're always out there. There was one story that you may have seen, you know, it went around on Facebook and Twitter a few weeks ago, a few months ago maybe, and it was about Miss Puerto Rico. Did anyone hear about this? What happened with that? So Miss Puerto Rico responded uh, to a tweet with an Islamophobic statement. So, it, so she responded to someone else's tweet with, with an Islamophobic statement. And she was later suspended by the Miss America um, Corporation. And so the story went around as, oh, this is terrible. Look at Miss Puerto Rico. You know, and people were sort of like angry at what she had done and saying that she got suspended. But they sort of like didn't read the story because it was... It was how she ended up getting suspended that I thought was very important. It wasn't Miss America, you know, Miss America Corporation that just decided, hey, this is really bad and we're going to get, you know, we, we aren't going to tolerate this kind of bigotry within the, the uh, corporation or this organization. It was actually ordinary Puerto Ricans 
most of which, of course, are not Muslim. You know, has anybody been to Puerto Rico? It's like the most beautiful place on earth. I love Puerto Rico. But it was ordinary Puerto Ricans in a Spanish language social media campaign with the hashtags in Spanish, does not represent us, and embarrassment that got her suspended. It was ordinary people who may not know a Muslim who said, that's not okay. That doesn't get to happen. You don't get to represent our state and then act like a bigot. That is a really important story. These weren't, you know, attorneys at ACLU. These are ordinary people in a place where there actually aren't that many Muslims who just knew in their heart this was wrong and did something about it at such a mass scale that she was suspended. Did you guys hear about this thing called the Coalition for Humanity? They were planning protests in front of mosques in 20 cities um, last fall. Well, you may or may not have heard about it because it actually ha like didn't happen. It was this big plan and, and they called everybody to come protest at the mosque in their city, in 20 different cities across the country. And in the uh, call to action, it, it said something like, and you know, practice, you know, exercise your full constitutional rights, including your Second Amendment. So people are actually being encouraged to come armed to these protests against mosques. And so there was this huge mobilization, people around the country, of interfaith allies who came and stood with their Muslim brothers and sisters in solidarity against these would-have-been protesters. Well, guess what? The protesters actually mostly never showed up. They were overpowered by this show of solidarity. And the ones that did come, instead of hundreds and thousands as, as they were promising, it was one or two. In one particular place, it was one woman who was greeted, hugged by one of the mosque uh, sisters, and invited in for coffee and donuts. That's how that story ended. So don't feel isolated and don't feel that this is something that only one group is, is, is in by themselves. How many people follow Humans of New York? Everybody in the world, yeah. I did think it was interesting that the letter that was written um, and posted on Humans of New York that was basically calling out bigotry of a certain presidential candidate was the most shared post in the history of Facebook. And I think that's really interesting because a lot of times people believe, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, that you need to be hateful or pornographic to get people's attention. And you actually don't. You just need to say something that a lot of people feel but don't know how to put in words. And then it's post that is the most shared one on Facebook. And I'll end with a personal story that I, I really derive inspiration from. And it was what happened to me shortly after 9-11. It was actually the same week the horrific attacks of 9-11 were on a Tuesday. And not only had my country been attacked in such a horrific way, but somebody else's actions had turned me from a citizen to a suspect. And that Friday, when Muslims gather for Jummah, for, for Friday prayer, 
we were hearing warning after warning that it might be a place, a, a time of reprisal attacks, that it might be a target for threats. And this was not paranoia. I have, I know several uh, institutions on that day that were um, targeted. And a friend of mine in Colorado, in Denver, Colorado, actually had to evacuate their Islamic school on that exact same Friday because of a bomb threat. And so we had this choice to make. Should we go to the mosque on that day or should we heed these warnings and stay home? And we decided that we had to go. We had to go come what may, whatever we might find there. Because we couldn't allow fear to kill our freedom. We couldn't allow the actions of criminals to define who we were or what we were going to be in our own country. So we went to the mosque. We drove there that first Friday in a brand new town we had just moved into. And I, I was carrying my one-year-old, and I walked in, I took my shoes off, and what I saw inside the mosque made me stop. It was totally full. And then the imam announced a thank you to our interfaith neighbors who had come not to attack us that day but to stand in solidarity with us. A full half of the mosque that first Friday after 9-11 were Christians, Jews, atheists, Buddhists who came because they put courage and compassion before fear and prejudice. And now the question to all of us is, what will you do? Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think that was a very, very inspiring talk for me and for many of us. Um, actually, let's give her another round of applause. So again, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, the plan for now is that we are going to break for Maghrib prayer, the evening prayer for the Muslims. Um, and we're going to pray in about 10 minutes. Um, so for the, the Muslims can go ahead and make their way to the prayer room, which is through these two doors over here. Um, and then if, if you would also like to observe uh, the prayer, you can, you can stand in the hallway or you can go and observe as well. Um, and you can also help yourself to food. So enjoy. versus Europe, there are some really interesting differences. One major difference is that for the most part, in America, Islamophobia is usually through the prism of security, terrorism, and these kinds of things. So it's, um, it's kind of thinly veiled as a national security issue. In Europe, 
it's actually not as much focused on security. It's much more focused on culture. That the Muslims are a, um, a threat to European identity and they are a that they're hurting European values and European culture. I think that there is an undercurrent of the same thing in America, but it's a lot harder to just be overtly, um, you know, vocal in that way that that Muslims just as a as a different religion are are hurting America as you know because America is. It's, more has a, a, a tradition of pluralism than does Europe. So in, in Europe, it's it's a lot more cultural and, and, and in terms of like, they don't share our values and things like that. Um, whereas here, it's more security. Where there is a commonality is, is, is in both places, there is a narrative around dual loyalties. And there is a narrative around um, that these people can't really be true Brits or true French people or true Americans because of their faith. States when I was very young, and I grew up in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And so the, the day that I became politically conscious, and I guess it was also the day that I feel that I became an American Muslim in terms of my identity, was when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 15 years old. And I think everything changed after that. And, and it was just really a pivotal event in my life where I discovered that there was like a history of, of Islam in America and that it was a transformative force for good. And it was something I felt so proud of and I felt a connection to. Um, and it grounded me in the United States as like an inheritor of that movement in some ways. And I felt um, that it was now on our generation to, to continue that struggle. You mean, have I ever experienced Islamophobia? Yeah, I have seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have on like a, on, on a personal level, you know, um, I've seen it in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, I've seen it in, in terms of institutionalized Islamophobia. After 9-11, the FBI came to my door for no reason other than because I was a Muslim and wanted an interview. So that's one way that it manifests itself, is, is that it becomes a framework for law enforcement. Um, I, I've had women, you know, scream things at me in, in stores and, and so forth. I. What I've experienced much more often, and I think it's important to you know keep this in mind, is quite the opposite. It's people really reaching out and being, um, you know, in the spirit of, of what they believe in, wanting to do what's right, and and that's that's really inspires me to to keep doing this work.
hear me? When, if a person is, uh, falls under certain circumstances, I think I think it's really hard to hear you. Can you speak into the mic a little more? Uh, if a person would, uh, uh, would fall under conditions where they face Islamophobia or were exposed to Islamophobia, uh, what would you advise that person to do with uh, direct Islamophobia? Do you uh, suggest uh, facing it individually or contacting organizations? Or what's the best approach to that when someone is affected directly? Well, it, it, you know, of course it depends on what happened. So there's different things to do in different cases. If it's an actual hate crime, an actual attack, um, or what you believe is a hate crime, then you have to notify the police, and then you have to report it so that it's counted in, in the statistics so that we know what's going on. And, and I, would, I would report it actually in the, in the official sort of FBI reporting mechanism and, um, and to a group like CARE, which, which is here in New, you know, Chicago as a wonderful chapter. Um, if it's something else that's on you know, an individual level, something that ha occurs in your children's school, um, then I would involve groups like CARE and then you know, move forward in, in addressing it with the administration. Uh, the, the thing that's really important is to address it. But the, you know, just ignoring it, it's just like a toothache. It's just like any disease. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. You have to address it in some way. Uh, definitely by reporting it, and then by confronting, by holding accountable those who may have abused their position of power or violated the law. And, and as hard as that is, and as much courage as that takes, it's really the only way that anything has ever changed in, in America, is by confronting this problem. You mentioned the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, through re reading um, works like that, we can get better in touch with the human experience. Um, for non Muslims who believe that Islamophobia is a problem, are there other works that you would recommend? Books to read about the human understanding? Wow. Do you mean more around the human experience or, or just books? So there's lots of really good books now about Islamophobia. Um, so there's one really, this is a report, it's less of a, like a novel, but it's called Fear Inc. And then Fear Inc. Point, uh, 2.0. So Fear Inc. actually documents the Islamophobia industry. And, and how it's manufactured, it is not an organic product, it is a manufactured product, it's a deliberately manufactured product. Fear Inc. actually gives you names, actual dollar amounts, I mean it's very rigorous in, in its documentation. There's another book called Islamophobia Inc. It's similar in, 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 in discussing this. Um, there's, there's one that came out recently and it was called, I think, Less... Yeah, I, I have to get the name exactly. Um, something Less something less Free. Less Safe, Less Free. Yeah. That's also a great uh, resource. So I think we'll take one more question. Um, so seeing that this is a form of justice, my question is, how can we get our fathers and brothers to take more feminist stand in our community? I'm just not sure how to begin that dialogue with the brothers in our community. That is a really good question. Well, let me start with a statistic, which is what I do. I start all conversations with statistics. That's why a lot of people want to avoid talking to me, usually. 
But one statistic that I just uh, recently saw, we, uh, so the organization I, I direct research for is called the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, and you can all look this up, ispu.org forward slash poll. So we just did a poll on American Muslim Jews, Catholics, and Protestants, and we asked all four groups identical questions. And we asked them about religion, politics, identity, and their views of violence. So totally boring topics. I don't think you'll anybody would be interested in, but there it is, ispu.org forward slash poll. One of our discoveries which seemed like it wasn't a discovery, but it actually was a huge discovery, is that American Muslim men and women are equally likely to attend a religious service once a week. Okay? So you have equal mosque attendance between men and women. And yet, are our, our prayer spaces designed with that assumption? No. They're not. Are the resources and the programming created with that assumption? No, usually not. So the reality and the assumptions that are used to create programming and resource allocation and space allocation are not connecting. There's a lot of outdated or, or um, you know, assumptions from a different um, a different part of the world that are being implemented, that are being used to implement and design um, our, our mosques and our sacred spaces. So I think that that's just a really simple thing is to say if you have an institution where you have equal attendance from people, two different groups, whatever they are, how would you design? that institution? Would you design it with space for you know, one group having half the space of the other? You would never do that. It wouldn't make any sense. But yet, somehow that, that, that flies as something that's okay in a mosque. So I think that's one way to start that dialogue. The second way to, to start it is to really say, really, I mean, this, is, this might sound trite, but what would the prophet do? What would the prophet do? I think studying the prophetic mosque is one of the best ways to make this really about following the sunnah. It, the kinds of things that fly in, in our institutions are complete anathema to what the prophet did. And this is, this is just a, a fact, and there's a four-part series that I encourage you to read. It was just released, like, last week. It was for the fourth section. It's Dr. Jasser Auda. He's a professor of Sharia, and he did a four-part series on, you know, women in the mosque, and, and taking from the classical sources and, and the prophetic tradition to argue for equity in, in, in sacred space and access in sacred space. There's so many reasons that um, everyone, men and women, should be pushing for everyone having equal access to their sacred to their to the sacred space that allows them to connect to their community and to connect with and to connect with God. Okay, thank you.